Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first episode of Gotham Writers Inside Writing. I hope you enjoyed our memoir-inspired music to start it off. Before we get started and meet our guests, a little bit about how today is going to work. So while the, uh, while the panel is going on, you can submit questions to the Q&A segment after the panel. With this button, it should be right about here. At least that's where it is for me. Uh, it'll say Q&A, and you just want to, anything memoir or publishing related that you want to pose to our panelists, we will get to that later. Also, stay tuned for instructions at the end of the show for how the Twitter pitch party is going to work for if you have a memoir that you want to pitch on Twitter. So housekeeping aside, let's talk about memoir, which was so aptly summarized by Anne Lamott, who said, you own everything that happened to you. Tell your stories. If people wanted to write, if people wanted you to write warmly about them, they should have behaved better, which we will, of course, be talking about more later. So let's meet our guests now. Uh, first off, uh, a wonderful writer and the, the author of the acclaimed memoir, The Family Gene, A Mission to Turn My Deadly Inheritance into a Hopeful Future, Jocelyn Linder. Jocelyn, how are you? Hi, coming. Hi. <laughs> there you are. And then our second guest, New Leaf Literary Agent. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, our second guest is New Leaf Literary Agent, uh, J.L. Sturmer. Hi, J.L. Hey, so excited to be here. Thank you for doing this, Josh. Absolutely. Hi, it's going to be fun. So let's start with our first question. Jocelyn, this question is for you. In, in the journey, particularly of the family gene, what were some of the challenges that came up from a publishing standpoint? Um, I mean, I had a really interesting experience uh, with getting with getting my memoir published. I had been doing some writer for hire jobs for years before that this came up and they hadn't done as well and my name was on some of them. So I remember when I was meeting with agents in the beginning, um, or sorry, meeting with ed with editors at the beginning, my agent was really clear to say, do not tell them that, like act like a novice, like you've never done this before, like you've never met editors. So I remember that was kind of a strange experience. But overall, I mean, it was a, you know, pu the publishing world is a crazy place. And I think that there is a little bit of a, of a, writers are a dime a dozen attitude that, that you can feel sometimes as a writer like you think you know you have this great project and you're so proud of it but then you sort of realize you know they have a lot of projects going on and you're one of them so it, and I think that can be a little bit of a shock it was there were you know there were issues that came up but it was overall for me I felt very lucky and I think that's you know getting a book published is a, is a really cool experience overall. So JL turning that on to the agent side of the spectrum, what do you find to be some of the obstacles specifically of selling memoir? And first off, is memoir a harder sell than other genres? So, I mean, I'm really relating to what you're saying, Jocelyn. Yeah, I do think it's a, I think it can be a harder, um, I think it can be a harder uh, genre to sell. One of the reasons is one of my least favorite things that happens when I'm, you know, talking to people who are writing uh, memoirs is, I kind of wear these two different hats. Like the JL hat is like psyched about something, like I'm interested in somebody's story, I understand where they're coming from, they're telling it with passion. And then the agent hat I have to put on and say like, am I going to be able to sell this? You know, and, and to be able to have a conversation with somebody when there's, when you've gotten to the point where you've like, you're, you finally have written it down and you have this incredible story to tell and you're finally ready to share it with people. Like I teach classes, right? I know how it is to be a Gotham student and it's, you kind of have to go through the process of, you know, getting your courage up to get your stuff out there all of a sudden to have an agent be like, eh, your life isn't interesting enough. I mean, like, that's not what people are saying, but it feels like the equivalent of that, right? Like somebody has this incredible experience and it's a life-changing thing. And then you got to think, well, if I can't sell it, like, or, you know, it feels like it's devaluing it, which is really challenging. Um, and it's something that I don't take lightly. And it's something that I talk about in this, in this manner. And I'm always very upfront with people because it is, it is super challenging um, just in terms of, you know your platform i'm sure we're going to get into all of that but the but the grand scheme of publishing like uh, you know i think editors and publishers when it comes to memoirs is how many how many people are you bringing how many people already know you how many people want to know read and hear what you have to say 
Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there for now, but uh, it's, it's a, it's, it's unto itself. It's a very different project than other nonfiction or fiction projects. Yeah, we will be yeah, talking. There's, I, I know, um, yeah, go sorry. I was, no, just, I was just thinking there is like a component you have to sort of be able to prove in any capacity as a writer, but definitely with memoir, not, I mean, obviously our life experiences are individual, but maybe the overarching theme of your book, there might be a lot of people that have had a similar thing happen. So why you? Like, why is your story the one that they want to sell or tell? So that is like a big piece of it as well. Yeah, and, and, and we'll, we'll talk more about platform and that here in a bit. Uh, Jocelyn, I wanted to, to follow up a bit about the family gene and its journey to, to publication. So if I understand correctly, it's sold on proposal in preempt and then you wrote the book. Is that how it worked? Yeah, that's how mine works. And I, and I don't know, I think that it, it, it seems to change quite a bit. I, I, still, I still know people that are selling nonfiction on, on proposal. So I think it still happens. Um, but it, you know, I think it depends now. I think now more and more, everybody wants a complete manuscript if you can. But I mean, I do think that also comes up, you know, the kind of, uh, this is such a funny thing to say is lucky, but my lucky thing is that I have a genetic condition that only 14 people have ever had. And it's, you know, uh, super unlucky to have that genetic condition, but it kind of does make me somebody that is the only person really that can tell this story or one of 14 people that can tell this story. Um, so that, that, that did give me a little bit of a leg up in terms of selling it on proposal. And JL, do you, following up on what Jocelyn said, do you, would you rather see memoirs in full manuscript form or is proposal okay? Well, it's so funny because I'm listening to you and I'm thinking like, you know, um, you are unique and your story is unique, but as an agent, sometimes I'm going to think, well, there aren't enough, I would, I would want to read, um, you know, more of it and I would want to understand like the scope of the story and what are the things that are going to be connected to the wider audience because that's the thing that I'm looking for because sometimes when someone has a very specific experience and it doesn't necessarily and, and it's it's too kind of like distant for the general public and they can't kind of connect the threads on their own then it's not really serving a purpose but as an author if you're able to kind of talk about your specific experience and then have people feel the energy of kind of like whatever it is that you went through and they can feel inspired even if they didn't live your life they can find inspiration in it and i think that's in the writing that's in your storytelling that's in your word choice that's in your pacing that's in how relatable you are um but to answer your question you know i kind of like if someone is more well known and a lot of their content is already online, um, like for instance, I, ha I'm, I represent a woman named Lara Parker and she's a BuzzFeed editor. And she has, an, uh, she has a book coming out in, uh, in October called Vagina Problems. And she's been suffering with endometriosis and a bunch of vagina problems for, you know, since she was 14 years old. And in this configuration, and she writes these very like passionate, heartfelt essays and just about the trials and tribulations of having your lady parts not working properly and living in this highly sexualized world like how do you navigate so fascinating stuff passionate stuff she didn't have the entire manuscript written but there was enough stuff for me to point to online for editors and say you know she she has a following she has a platform so there is some kind of in between where I can sell a memoir based on like how much stuff have you done on your own if people come to me and they've been sitting in their attic and they hand me their memoir and nobody knows about them then that's like a different kind of a, a configuration um, I went off yeah. on a tangent. What were you, what were you asking? You asked me a question and I lost it. <laughs> Whether or not you like to read, um, proposals, but I was going to, I just want to tag on that my yeah. proposal was like almost 60 pages. Like it isn't like when you, when you sell on proposal, you're like, yeah, like here's my little three page summary. Like it is a chunk of, of information and you, and I had to outline every chapter. I mean, it was a lot of work at the end of the day. I've had, I've had projects like that too. So I think in a situation where somebody has less of a platform, I'm more apt to take something out that is like a little bit more piecemeal. But if somebody, but I'm, to, if I'm totally moved by somebody's story and they don't really have it going on online and I feel like I can figure out some way to do it, like I will, you know, like I will want them to write the entire manuscript because we kind of have to go through that process. Like I don't necessarily know how you write and in terms of selling you, I just think that editors, like a good memoir, you wanted to read like a novel. So I think that editors want to know like, okay, you have this incredible story. 
how is your pacing? Do you lose people in the middle? Like writing a book is hard, <laughs> you know? And just because you have a great story to tell doesn't necessarily mean that you're a good storyteller and you can keep people's attention. So for that purpose, on a case-by-case -case basis, like I kind of want to read the whole thing. If I think that an editor, I'm going to need to give an editor an entire manuscript. Mm -hmm. Jocelyn, at what, yeah. at what point- um, I asked also Go ahead. I was just going to say, I, it, Jael had said in the beginning of, of her answer that, um, you know, sometimes having a, a storyline that's too narrow or, or a story that's too narrow, a, a memoir story, um, that, you know, she looks for the broader story. And I, and I, when I'm teaching memoir classes, we talk about that a lot, like that maybe there is a way to sort of have a universal, you know, if somebody wants to talk about work or something and it's, say it's a woman and she wants to talk about her experience in the workplace. I often say like, what if you weave in the history of feminism in America or the history of women in the workplace or, you know, offering ideas to sort of um, help your story become something that isn't just about you, but can also be, you know, applied to other people. So that is something, I think that's a great point, actually. I just wanted to- Thank, you. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> I appreciate that on my end. <laughs> Jocelyn, at what point in the process of that proposal did you get your agent? Was it something where the, the proposal you gave your agent was in the similar proposal that they sold it on, or was there some workshopping there? That's a good question. I had the first agent I had in New York, uh, I got um, because we had a crush on the same guy and we were at a party. <laughs> so, you know, New York City, I think that, you know, so, so I had, I had already had representation. Uh, and then that agent actually left the world of agenting, I hope not because of me, but uh, she left the world. And then, uh, and then I, I moved on to her, her boss became my agent. And then, and so she and I had, she actually, that agent named my book, she came up with the family gene. Um, and we had talked about the project early on. But then when I was finally kind of getting ready to, to work on it, I just felt like she wasn't helping me in a way that I wanted to be helped. So then I went on a a mission for an agent, which is, was something I hadn't had to do because I socialized very well at parties, I guess. <laughs> and, um, and so when I, at that point, went to go find an agent, I, I did have to, uh, you know, come up with a query, come up with a sort of a proposal at that point that was cobbled. And so it was, it was early on. I mean, I hadn't at that point written very much. I had been sort of writing ideas that I had uh, go, going, you know, I was, I had taken a Gotham class. I had met writers. I had sort of created a writing community, which I think is vital for writers. Um, and then, and then I, so through them, they were the ones that actually said to me at one point, like, you should tell that story about your dad. You should write that. And I was like, really? But it's just my life. You know, having no idea why that would be interesting to anybody. Um, and then realizing how I could tell it, I think, and then meeting the agent. So I think I had the, this breakthrough where I was like, I know how I'm going to tell the story. And then, I, and then I queried agents and then I found my agent. Gotcha. And, and Jail, when you get a proposal or a query, do you have to have a specific idea of how you're going to sell it before you take it on or are you more or did you just gravitate towards stories you like is there a distinction I mean there? I mean like I, you know I think initially when I first started agenting I just grad I just gravitated toward things that I liked because that's what we do naturally as humans you know like you want you want the cool stuff that's interesting to you and I learned as it sounds like Jocelyn too has learned you kind of go through a progression you know I, I took on a lot of stuff that I, Kate, I took it on from a, from a genuine place, but like, I didn't know what the hell to do with it. And it wound up being kind of an exercise in frustration. And I kind of needed to learn my lessons along the way, much in the same way that Jocelyn was saying like, oh, like, you know, you're at a party, you meet an agent. And of course they're like dazzled by your personality. And of course you have a story. And when the things kind of come to you when you weren't necessarily looking for them with specific questions in mind it can be fun but it more often than not what I find is that it's really a learning opportunity because it's only when you're asking like you learned about what kind of agent you wanted to have by working with like a bunch of agents that were not a good fit for you but you didn't know that they weren't a good fit unless you had those experiences with them and that helped you kind of hone in so when you went seeking yes you had to do the query work and yes you had to do all the things that maybe you felt like why do I have to do this now like I already like you know I had a couple of agents but when you're specific about what you want I think that that's when you find you know what you're what you're looking for however like you know cl cliche that might sound but I think that for me um, my clients now like when I look at my roster now and how it's evolved over the years it makes sense to me it looks like a reflection of 
you know, uh, <laughs> you know, were you, were you thinking about Lenny Dykstra? You want me to get into my Lenny Dykstra story? Yes, yes, please do. <laughs> So if anybody doesn't know who Lenny Dykstra is, he was um, he was a, play, a baseball player on the Mets, and he was like in the 1980, I want to say 86, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, World Series, and he was just this kind of, Jocelyn, do you know who he is, Lenny Dykstra? I don't know, sports come up in my eyes glaze. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's fine. He was a baseball he was a baseball player who had this very kind of larger than life, had, you know, like bought mansions and jets and just lived like, you know, he was steroids. His, his, um, his nickname was Nails because he was tough as nails. And there used to be this, this uh, poster of him, you know, shirtless, just wearing like the baseball, you know, pet, pet pants, like holding a bat, like all kind of good, like an 80s poster that like girls would hang on their wall. Like he's this guy, he's ego, he's, but he gets shit done. Like he gets things done. Like he helped them, you know, he, he talks a big talk, but he also delivers. So I had an, I had a, uh, I had a, pu um, a publicist friend in LA who suggest, who said, you know, I have this potential project for you. Um, I'm going to lay it out there. If you want to do it, let me know if you don't, like, I totally understand. And he said, Lenny Dykstra. And I knew this guy was like a crazy Meshuggah guy, but I also knew that he had a story. So I was like, all right, let's do Let's do it. My experience, this book is called, um, House of Nails. I think it's called House of Nails. I was trying to look for a copy of it. And I think it's very telling that I don't even remember the title right now. It was a New York Times bestseller. It was the most stressful, frustrating, awful. I, I'm not a yeller. Like the guys in my office that I worked outside of accounting and they knew when I was on a call with Lenny Dykstra because we were just, I was trying to sh out shout him because he was just so crazy. And I learned, I will never, and it put my spidey senses up. So when I feel like there's a diva personality or I feel like there's somebody that's really not in touch with themselves and I need to understand why you want to tell your story right now, if I can connect with the real part of you and I'm pretty good at seeing that, then I'm in, I'll take it another couple steps. But if I feel like it's a lot of puffery and you just say, every, you know, people want me to write a book or, you know, granted this was a, was a, was a, an athlete who, you know, ha had a, had a larger than life presence. But I learned so many lessons, you know, in that, in that, just in terms of feeling out who's a good fit for you. Like who's a good fit for you. Like you were saying, Jocelyn, about like working with the editor and working by yourself like to get to the 60 pages like you got to get somebody that's going to dig in with you and work with you if it needs that kind of work and not everybody's going to do that so anyway um bring me back bring me back where was i i <laughs> saw <laughs> i i also think it's important for writers to remember too that at this point the way that the and correct me if I'm wrong, JL, but I'm pretty sure that the, the, the way the business is structured now is agents really rep projects. They don't rep the person as much. Like you obviously create, hopefully create good relationships with your agent and they will, you know, my agent, the one that I'm working with now, who's the same one that did the family gene, reads everything I send her and gets back to me and we talk about it. Um, but I have already in my mind thought, well, if she doesn't take this or that, I might go out to other agents with it, you know? So um, that is, and that's okay. She knows that, she expects that. And, you know, so that is also part of the format is you, you're not, when you're choosing an agent, you're, you really need to think about the project and not necessarily like your entire uh, career as a writer. You can really just focus. Well, that's so funny because I actually like to have those conversations with, you know, you're saying that and I'm kind of like, I'm kind of like, I don't want my clients going off and get, sending their projects to other agents. <laughs> other agents like I definitely and but this is a perfect point because I think for anybody that's watching when you're thinking about what is my relationship with an agent you know like and especially when you're working on memoir and something that's so dear and personal to you like you gotta be you have to be comfortable with somebody and you need to have those conversations in the beginning if I have something that you're not representing is it okay is this something that we can do because i'm definitely looking for people i want to develop a good relationship with somebody and then I want to rep all their stuff so we can kind of have, have an ongoing, um, you know, uh, uh, business relationship, but I'm not going to rep something that I don't, you know, that I don't feel comfortable with, or I don't necessarily feel like is your forte. Like, I think having an open line of communication is, um, is really important as far as that's concerned. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned something there, Justin, I want to ask you about this. Was, 
in writing memoir, was there a degree of separating that emotional side of writing something so personal with, especially in your circumstance where you already knew it was headed towards publication? Did you have to separate the emotional side from the, the, the get the job done side? Yeah, I just, uh, I just pitched uh, an article to the Times that she bought. I don't know if it'll ever make it because then, then the world went crazy after I wrote the article. But um, about, it's called something called alexithymia because I was like convinced I had what is, what is known as emotional blindness. I was like, there's something wrong with me that I am able to, you know, because also it's not just in, I'm kidding, I don't actually have it. I'm sort of kidding. I <laughs> sort of have something weird. But, you know, the whole thing is like um, when when you're, it's not just writing this book, right? Because after you write it, you have speaking engagements. I've been doing speaking engagements since the book came out three years ago. I was on Dr. Oz a few months ago. You know, like it's, I, I you know, I'm, I feel like I'm, there's constantly been these like little resurgence where I'm doing a bunch of talks at a time. And the subject matter, you know, it's about my father's death. It's about my sister, my sister's health, my health, you know, and these are conversations I have to have. I went some, um, before my book sold, actually, I had done a TED Talk, which is something else we can maybe get into when we talk about platform. But um, I had done this TED Talk about the gene. And I remember during the dress rehearsal, the director goes, um, just be careful you don't smile when you talk about your dad dying or, you know, some, some horrible part of the story. I had like a big smile because I think I was just trying to say the words and I wasn't really connecting to them. So, I mean, there is definitely a part of i think i think you do, we talk about it in my class writing from the scar and not the wound you know trying to it, i think the more emotion you have when you're writing a the harder it is to, to write but also you know just um you might not be as good at it right because the clarity isn't quite there you can't quite get the narrative down because you're so busy sort of i don't know with the with the the uh, mirror on yourself or you know, I, I remember at one point with my editor her her kind of doing huge cuts in this, what I thought was just this beautiful section about how wonderful my dad was. And she's like, it's great. Like, I'm glad your dad was a nice guy, but it's just, it's not necessary. You know, so you do have, a, there's a little bit of perspective, I think, which is why we have editors and agents to help us. But, you know, then also our own sort of being able to write from a place where we are clear and not necessarily really deep in the emotions. I mean, it is, it's very helpful. Whether or not we can all do it is, is another question. And JL, is that something you have yeah. to help your clients with at times? Or your I memory? mean, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, you know, it's, in, it's interesting to hear you talk about this. And I love right from the scar and not the wound. I will, I will attribute it to you, but I, I, might, I might say that at some point. Yes, um, use it. Somebody gave it to me, so I, away. I like that. I feel like um, what, what I was thinking, uh, what I heard from what you were saying, Jocelyn, is that much like I put my JL hat on and my agent hat on, that when you're writing, that you want to write from a place where you're just like feeling all the feels and you're letting it all out. And then you kind of have to compartmentalize a little bit and understand that the selling part of it and the promotion part of it, that's not a natural human. Some of us are better at it than others. And if you're not good at it, it feels like a stress to kind of uh, you know, like to be open and vulnerable in a way that is commercially viable. I mean, it sounds, cr it sounds crazy. It sounds crazy, but I think that, you know, writing in a bubble of feeling safe and comfortable and really kind of letting it all out and working with a team who is understanding, you know, but is also going to be like, keep it real with you is really important. So that by the time you're going out, you know, to, to talk about your work that you can, and it sounds like what you're doing, and I think this is what we should all do, um, get your talking points feel comfortable with them, be able to kind of adjust the levels based on where you are and what, who you're talking to and what you're talking about. And I think that, you know, that takes a lot of practice. Like I totally want to hear about your TED talk. That sounds really scary. And I've seen a lot of car wreck TED talks where people are excited about their TED talk. And then you're kind of like, wait a minute. <laughs> like that, that was kind of uncomfortable, but, um, but yeah, I think that part of what I do as an agent, and I'm doing it right now, like having the reconfiguration conversation when you go out with something and it doesn't necessarily work. And I know that it's there. I know that the content is there, but we, I guess we didn't present it in the way we thought we had. And now we have to kind of like do a little rejiggering in order to, you know, go out on another round of submissions. So, you know, Josh, to answer your question, like, yes, I do feel like that's a part of what I do. Um, it's definitely one of the things that I 
I kind of, I kind of like to do it. It's more fun than emails. It's more creative. It's more connection. It's more, um, it feels more stimulating than chasing payments and contracts, which is clearly something that I do. Um, so yeah, I think it, I, I, but again, it's the agent that you link up with because some agents, they just want your stuff to be ready to go and they want to sell it. And they are about a lot of things all at once. And it's an, it's an energy. And I think that it's important, especially with memoir, because it's so sensitivo. You got to find, you got to find the right match and the person that understands what you're trying to do. I also have to say that right this minute and my students, I know I'm having this in every, in both of my memoir classes, just how emotional we all feel right now. And I think we're all, so, I mean, when you're actually trying to write some of the harder things in your life at this particular moment in time, I say like, give yourself a little break. If you have to, you know, focus on the happy days, that's okay. If that's what the stuff you want to work on right now, because I think we're all a little bit, um, you know, it's a little bit of a struggle for everyone right, th right this minute. So, JL, I want to about the writing journey. I, I want to come at you with a quote real quick. So, Henry Henry David Thoreau called it vain to sit down to write when you have not stood up to live. So, in applying that to memoir, do you believe that anybody can write a publishable memoir, or do they have to have done something unique or stood up to live? I love this question. Um, the agent hat in me is like, you have to like do something. You need to have done something. You need to do some, and especially in this day and age, because we're all, and now more we're so on all online, like there, we have the means to get something out there. Granted, there is a lot of uh, noise and you, you know, it's, it's like hard to get through everything, but we all have the means to kind of put something out there and do something. So I do think from an agent point of view, from what I know editors are looking for, from the kind of information that I want to tell an editor about a client, like if you're not doing it, somebody else is gonna do it, whatever it may be. It might be like baking the perfect cheesecake, it might be like, you know, getting together like the Million Man March, <laughs> like it could be whatever, whatever it is. But it's so funny, it's so funny that you mentioned that. I had a couple of books <laughs> here next to me and I, went, and I pulled this from my shelf. So I don't know if anybody knows, um, this is Zach Walls. He is currently a, uh, he's a senator in um, Iowa. And this book came out from Penguin um, uh, Random House back in 2012. And he was nice. So basically Zach, he has two moms and they were looking to repeal the same sex marriage laws in Iowa. And there was a town hall meeting where people were getting up and there was the pros and the cons and you have three minutes to get up to your lectern and you know talk about why you're pro or con. And, Zach got up and he was like 19 years old, like, you know, and, and very tall. He's like six, five. And you could see, and he started to speak about how his family is a family. And, and it was like on Facebook and it went viral. And you could even see while you were watching the video, that there were like a bunch of people that were like sitting around like this. And then as he started talking, people were like sitting up in their chairs. And then at the end, like everybody was applauding. And I was like, this dude, this dude, I, I, like this dude has something to say. And when I reached out to him, we had a couple of Skype conversations and he said to me, I don't know, like I'm 19, like I just lived my life. Like, how am I writing a memoir? Like, what, like, what do I have, what do I have to say? He has a, a, a biological sister and they were from the same test tube. Like he has his bio, you know, his bio mom and then he, he has his other mom and they're, he's like, we do our homework, we go to church, we, you know, we do the chores. We, and I was like, that's your book, dude. Like, that's your book. We're like, it's just a regular family. Like you don't need to repeal same sex matter, you know, like just that perspective and that point of view. And so from that, you know, that was a situation where he felt like he didn't necessarily, you know, have something to say. And then we had a conversation about it. And then it was, it, you know, our, we have a quote from Ellen DeGeneres. Like she, he went on Ellen, I went with him. It was amazing. He was on the Daily Show with Jon Stewart. I was like crying in the, <laughs> in the audience. So I think that, you know, you do, you know, I think that to answer your question, yes, anyone can write a memoir in the same vein as anyone can make a change in the world, not to be too cliche, but it's really about the time, what is it that you have to say, the timing of what you have to say, and how can you weave it into what everybody else is talking about right now? Because publishing is about riding the wave. They're not about 
innovation. They want to know what is everybody talking about? We're going to get on it. We're going to get on it. So if you can figure out how to weave your story into the news cycle, for lack of a better term, like that's something that I would suggest people think about because that makes it easier for me. That makes it easier for your agent to sell a project. So Jocelyn, kind of going the same way with you, having read a little bit of your writing journey, did you go looking for stories? Like, did you sort of go out there looking for something to write about or did you just kind of live your life and then you found all these things you could write about along the way? Um, that's a great question. I mean, I think that I, uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, a little bit, I was taking a class and realizing that I liked writing, that it felt, that felt like something I wanted to be doing. And then, and then you start to look for stories. I think that happens. I think getting, obviously, anytime uh, you hear, I think a great way to handle things is like follow some editors on Twitter that are, you know, working for magazines or, you know, where you can have a uh, personal, you know, nonfiction or essay published. And they'll throw out there, like, we're looking for articles about adventures on vacation or something. And then you kind of catalog through your life and go, oh, yeah, I can write about that, you know, and, and try to write it. And whether or not you, su you submit it, at least you're getting some writing done. It's a good way to get some prompts. Um, but yeah, like, and then a little bit, you mine your own life. You try to figure out the things that you've done that are worth writing about. Um, I think that in my experience with, non, with, with writing personal essay, because I haven't always done that, it's, I've now kind of, I think, I see that I, the things that get bought tend to have to refer back to a little bit genetics in my, in my story, um, which sometimes disappoints me, but also I understand like that sort of, at this point with the platform is built around, I have a lot of connections in the rare diseases world, and that's a huge number of people and things like that. So that's really where um, people are more interested in hearing me write about or talk about. So that's, that's where things are now but yeah i think I, I always do say um when people ask about like how do i you know when they say like oh my kid is a writer what should i suggest for them or you know whatever people want advice and i always say like number one you have to you know write that's the first thing number two you have to read things that are like what you want to be writing that can really help inspire you and then number three is you have to live right like that is i think that is a great i mean i'm not sure thoreau like i don't know i feel like his mom like did his laundry i don't know i don't know <laughs> The more you learn, you're like, mm, I don't know about that guy. <laughs> He's a good writer. <laughs> so since we're getting a lot of questions about this anyway, so let's, let's jump into talking about platform. Uh, JL, we'll start, start with you. How much, uh, I mean, just open into question, how, how big of a, a, a thing is a platform for an aspiring nonfiction, especially a memoir writer? I mean, platform, just I think it, it, it continues to become more and more important as much as, um, I, I, and, and whatever resistance I have, I think that's maybe part of, my, part of my own thing because I think, again, if we're all going to be communicating with each other, we all need to have some kind of a, of a platform if we're going to continue working you know, from home and whatever it is that we're doing, I think that you know, ha having that is important. But I think in terms of getting a book deal, um, I think it's important and I prefer that people have a platform. I mean, and I, and, I, and I will say that there are quite a few people that I've been working with for a few years who I connected with who didn't have a platform and we talked about a potential project, but basically we're on a like, let's stay in contact. I like the way that you're thinking. I like this angle that you're taking. You need some bylines. You need to make yourself an expert in this world or you need to become the go-to person for this specific kind of content because the idea that you have um, is, 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 is unique and I can sense your passion in the way that you want to talk about it. So I will have kind of in-depth conversations with people and say, get out into the world and like, sh like do, this is what you're gonna need to do in order to sell a book, right? If you wanna work, if you wanna sell a book and for, with a traditional publisher and you wanna have an agent and you're not gonna do like self-publishing and the myriad other things that are available to you, if you want that specific path, I'm telling you, this is what I'm gonna need from you. So if you want to do that, then please do that and know that I'm here. Like you, we can have check-in calls. Like don't be like you have to hurry up. Don't be like everything. Like as you do the work and as you establish your voice in a certain area, um, 
then we just kind of keep 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 talking about it. And and so I'm working with quite a few people right now, and I feel excited because I'm like I planted some cool seeds. I know these are conversations and topics that are going to be kind of like germinating and coming up now. They're kind of a little bit out ahead of what the general conversation is right now. Hence, don't rush because there everybody has to catch up. Because what I'm excited about, it might be a little bit too like you know I. I'm from Manhattan, like I went to public school. I feel very kind of like, I wanna know more, 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 and I've only lived here. And what I'm finding in publishing is that publishers want things that are going to appeal to the largest group of people, understandably so, it's a business. And sometimes the more kind of like esoteric or edgy ideas or however you wanna to refer to them, it takes a minute for them to kind of like flow into the general conversation and my what I what my goal is is to make sure that my people have their platform and they have their bylines and they're on podcasts and they're maybe having their own podcast they're doing whatever they can to further their message on their end and then I'm going to be able to take it and turn to the editors and say this many don't ask me for how many followers I don't know it always like fluctuates but you know this many followers, like this, you know, active on these, you know, platforms and, and give me something to work with. I'll tell you what you need. Give me something to work with and then I can make it work for you because an agent making an empty promise to somebody who isn't ready to go, it's like you're not doing anybody any favors. And I know, cause I did that. I did that in my early days cause I was excited, but it's, you know, it's, uh, it's a little bit more than excitement. But I think that it, that's a really important thing that, you know, that I look for and that you can convey as, as an author, you want to convey, this is what I'm excited about. This is why I'm excited about it. This is why I'm the person to tell this story. Um, so the, and a platform, however your configuration is, helps you do that. You know, whether it's by articles or podcasts or videos or IG live or whatever it is. Jocelyn, what was your platform like? Um, I have so many opinions about platforms. I, so I've heard so many different people coming at this from so many different places. I will tell you my personal experience was when, when each of my books came out and I posted on pre-sales, like the, the book had gone into pre-sales and it's time to order. Every single time those books were bestsellers. That was the only time any of the books were bestsellers <laughs> because after they came out, that hasn't happened, but yet. But, um, but you know, that's, and for me, that was huge because what that did with my publisher was that they then bumped the book, right? Like they suddenly, a couple of them hired publicists for the book or just put more focus on the book. I, a couple of my books got on Barnes and Noble tables because, which is a big deal. It's a whole it's a whole thing that you learn about when you publish, but you know, so things like that happen and it was a hundred percent because I would post, because I had really spent time cultivating this Facebook audience um, more than any of the other platforms, but I have all of them and I try with all of them, but Facebook for whatever reason, I had the most engagement and the, and what I thought of it as is like back in the day, you could like, you know, if you wanted to sell something or tell people about what you're doing with your life, you had to like post it on a, on a church or synagogue bulletin board. You had to like call your school and see if you get put in people's bulletins. Now you can just friend everybody you've ever met in your whole life and be like, hey, this cool thing is happening. And, and people care, like people get excited because they're like, oh, I knew her or I know her. I feel like I have this relationship with her. I, you know, I really tried to gear my posts um, to like sort of being funny or just being entertaining. And I try to avoid politics, which is really hard, but I do, you know, things like that. Like I try really hard to just keep a really like fun place. Like people, and people tell me like, I like your Facebook posts. And I always think that that's good because what I'm actually doing is the next time I have an article or a book or anything that comes out, I'm going to post it and I'm going to, and I know I'm going to get 300 immediate likes, you know, maybe even 500, 600, you know, like they, it's, but it has taken years. Right. So I, and I feel like, why not? Like people who say, I'm not going to do it. I'm like, why not? Like you have all the control over the content. You don't have to turn it into a whole thing. You, you know, you don't have to read other people say it's going to suck away my time. Don't let it, you know, let it check in on it once a day, post, a, you know, something four times a week, three times a week, and just kind of build a little audience. And, and it's, absolutely worth it it absolutely can really benefit you in really actual actual ways that you can see once you start publishing so i think it's i think it's great to have one with social media and i know there's a bigger 
I mean, for me also to answer your question, I, I, again, like the Ted talk. So there was a point early on when I immediately thought like the joke was I wanted to, I'll do anything like jeans, the musical. Like I was like this American life and, you know, pitching anybody. I was like, who will, who will tell the story? So, so the book, you know, the story was told in NBC.com on their launch. Tony DeCopel, who's on ABC this morning or CBS this morning, um, wrote it and, and you know, he at that point was working for NBC.com. Build buzz around my story so that when I went out to agents, I wasn't just like, hey, you know, I, I have an idea. I was like, not only do I have an idea, but all these people already like the idea and have either written about it or talked about it. So. Thank you. So let's, let's get into our questions from some of our attendees. Uh, you answered a lot of them already, but uh, I guess let's start with with Jay. Uh, let's start with Jocelyn for this one. We have a question from Holly who asked, "Should you submit excerpts from a memoir in progress to literary journals to try to get sm them published as a smaller piece? Is that a good idea or no?" Yes, I think it's always a good idea to have been published places. Um, you know, I think there are certain places that if you publish the excerpt, they you can't use it. But just to clarify. Like you can't use it in a book without permission. Sometimes they will happily give you permission. Um, other times, just to like be really clear, you still own your story. You just don't own that exact wording of the story. So you can rewrite it in a way that is appropriate for your book. Um, you know that, so that might be a consideration for you if you write something and you think I want this to be in the book. Well, maybe consider that a little bit, but I would say it's still worth it, right? Cause you're building a brand, you're building a audience you know, you're building all of those things that we were just talking about. So I think it's a great idea always. And JL, does it make it easier to sell a, a memoir if you can say that bits of it have been published elsewhere? Yeah, especially if there's been a good reaction to it. I mean, if it started a conversation um, and yes, if somebody, again, if somebody else took a chance on you, then a publisher might be more willing to take a, to take a chance on you. And it's also something that's proactive, right? It's something that you show that you're doing on your own. Um, and I, I appreciate, Jocelyn, your explanation of kind of how to, you know, reconfigure something. Um, because that's a conversation that I have a lot with people in terms of wanting to, you know, use whatever content, like, hey, I created this platform for myself, and here's all this content, and then the publisher is like, yeah, but we want everything that's new and original. So, you know, I think that I've done deals for clients where it was maybe like a 75-25 split in terms of new content versus stuff that was previously published, um, but again, re rewriting it, uh, I think, is, is a good, you know, idea to kind of have in the back of your head um but yes so the answer is yes it's good to have something that that's that's published and another question here and i, I imagine a lot of people struggle with this in memoir is how to navigate writing about family members if as Anne lamott says if they wanted to be portrayed better they should have acted better but jocelyn really? did did you have any problems with that or how did you navigate that spectrum I love that quote. I always misquote her. I'm like the worst quoter. I always say to my class, I'm going to misquote this, but this is my favorite quote by Anne Lamott. But yeah, I, um, I, you know, I, we had a villain in a gene. So I, you know, I really tried to remember that, but I, but I tell this story to my classes. I had a, I, my book first, the very first thing that I hit that I got was This American Life Bought the Story. Um, and so I immediately sent this email to my whole family, like, you guys will never believe it. This is the greatest thing ever. And I immediately got back this enraged response from one of my cousins who was like, you cannot tell the story publicly. This is, these are my family members. These are, my children aren't married. Like he had all these reasons. He was very, very angry. And my immediate response was like, really defensive and mad. And like, why is he doing this? And I went to a lawyer and I, you know, first found out you can tell any story that is your story. <laughs> so he couldn't have done anything. But then I, the more, you know, so kind of miraculously or whatever, however you want to look at it, that got killed. The Samaritan Life story never aired. Um, but it, and then, and then the NBC.com story aired that Tony wrote. So somebody else wrote my story and I had the experience of being written about. And it taught me everything about how to handle my family because really at the end of the day, losing control of your story feels hard, even if whatever the person writes is amazing. So it gave me such a different perspective. And so there, um, Mary Carr has a list of 11 
uh, ways to handle beloveds, I think it's called, and it's a wonderful list, I think. And uh, and it, it really, you know, her, some of her advice is um, tell people early, but don't show them anything till it's complete. Um, if you if you feel like you can share it with people, let them read it, listen to their feedback. If there's something you can delete because they don't like it, delete it. But get, also, I think for me, the experience I, I have this really quickly. This one one story was the same cousin that was really angry about This American Life. When the book was coming out, I gave them the sections that were about his father. And one of the sections I mentioned how it's, this is a little gross, so if you're eating, forgive me, but that the fluid that is part of our genetic disease um, filled his penis. Like that was part of the like horror of this disease for the men. And, um, and I gave that to him and he was immediately like, you can't, you can't write this, you can't have it. But I felt like it was a really, it was such a clear explanation for the horror and it just felt really important. So I waited, I said, okay, that's cool. I'll take it out. But I, you know, okay, cool. And then a couple of weeks, you know, a week or two later, I reached out again and I said, I just want to give you a couple of reasons why I'm thinking about wanting to use it, but I won't use it if you don't want me to. And I, and I gave him some reasons. And then sure enough, the third time I reached out, he said, I see what you're saying and I think you should use it. So I think that people even just being able to sit with it and feeling like they have a little say can be really helpful, but start telling people that you're thinking about writing or you're taking a writing class or you've been writing the family story, ask them questions, involve them. And I think ultimately people start to get excited and they lose some of that trepidation over somebody else telling their story. And JL, here's a question for you. How, how is the publishing industry inundated with kind of, I mean, everybody can, there are a lot of these stories of overcoming illnesses. Jocelyn's is, is unique because there are only 14 people had this illness. But is there any advice you would give to people that have a story that maybe has been told before, that maybe the publishing industry has seen so much of, yet it's still a big part of their lives? How do they tell that story in a unique way that hasn't been done before? Um, I just want to be clear. Wait, are you saying that this person has, has something like just for the sake of this conversation, like somebody who's dealing with cancer, like somebody who's, yeah, let's I say mean, I, I, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, let's say they're a cancer survivor. There are a lot of stories out there like that. So right, how, right. how do you make that story unique? So, so he, so, so here is me kind of like putting my, my agent hat on, which sometimes is a little bit tight and it hurts, <laughs> but it's kind of like. That's what has done nicely previously. So if you have, if you're telling a cancer story, one of the boxes that you can check is that like, okay, in the past, there have been cancer stories that have performed nicely. So that kind of ups my chance of being seen because they can, you know, like that, that, that's something that has been, uh, it's been broken in, it's been broken in a little bit. And it's such a lot, it's such a widespread uh, you know, disease that so many people are able to relate to either if they're dealing with them themselves or their family or their friends, you know, it's something so so that that part of it is good. Um, but I think that the thing that makes your story uh, ap appealing to publishers is really kind of, it, it, it is the uniqueness of it, right? So were we hearing, you know, like a cancer survivor who was you know, maybe just kind of like, um, I don't know, like, what's your life? What's your life? Are you a cancer survivor that lives in like a Brooklyn loft with like, you know, four other artists? Are you a cancer survivor who like, you know, is living in the suburbs? I, I think that, I think that it's the way that you handle, everybody's going to deal with, is going to have a certain similarity in terms of what their disease is and hopefully, you know, whether they're going to chemo or whatever the, whatever the medical part of it, whatever the thing that everyone has to do, that's the thing that the most people are going to relate to. But like how you handle it, how you handle your feelings, how you interact with your family, how, I think that that's, that's the, that's the unification and that's the specificity of like, how, that, that's the thing that's the most important. And I think that that's the thing that's the most interesting is how do we all find our way around things that are challenging us when it feels like we're all kind of dealing with the same thing and can you inspire somebody else? And can you like, we're, here we are at that, that thing that everybody always hears is like, what's the voice? Is it voicey? Is it voicey? Is it voicey? Like you gotta be you and you have to say the things that 
are the, you know, all, all, all of the iterations of what make you you through all of the processes that you go through. Is that too convoluted? Is, is that helpful? No, that makes sense. <laughs> I was going to say, like you're saying, the why me? Like you've just answer, you have to be able to answer the question why me, no matter what. So we're going to do one more question. I know Jocelyn, you have to go teach class at two o'clock, so I'll start with you and then I'll pose it to JL as well. But if okay. you had any advice to give somebody who is an aspiring memoirist that kind of wants to get into it but doesn't know how, what would you tell them? I mean it's too, it's you know it's back to my like write read and and live kind of advice but i do really feel like community is key right because i mean the fact of the matter is if you wrote write a page a day for a year you have a book right 365 pages and most people can write a page in 10 minutes so i mean realistically if you if you were like 10 minutes a day i'm going to write i'm going to write I mean, you can have a book done. So I just think it's a matter of having accountability. That's why I think the classes, you know, I think are such a great idea. And then within that class, you can find other people that want to be writing as well. You can create that community. You can, you know, have befriend them. You know, like I, I recently started teaching memoir too, and I wanted to bring in a published writer to talk to my class. And I realized in this like wonderful way, I was like, I have this whole community of people I can ask. And it started with Gotham. Like that's when I first started my first Gotham class that I took. That's when I started meeting other writers, people with these aspirations to publish who then published and now have books out. So um, that felt really fortunate for me. And, uh, and, and, and realizing that I had done that, like that I had done this thing that I tell everyone that they should do. And I think writing groups are a great way to do that as well because you have accountability, everybody has to submit a certain amount. So, um, you know, just make sure you're writing and it's hard to just make yourself write. So having accountability can be the key to that. And Jocelyn, you are good to go. Thank you so much for being here. Have a wonderful class. Thank you so much. It was nice to see you guys. All right, take care. Bye. Bye. Take care, have a good one. Bye. JL, same question to you yeah. very quickly because I have to, I have to, finish up here. Yeah, you hear Twitter, Twitter stuff. Okay, yes. Um, oh my god, what was, what was the question? <laughs> oh, what, what advice would I give somebody who's writing who wants to like dabble in the world of memoir? Who, who wants, wants to get to, started, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I loved everything that Jocelyn said. I think, again, with putting my agent hat on, I think that trying to figure out where your story fits into the current conversation, however that may be, and I'm not saying to you know, um, don't contort yourself. You can't do anything that's that's disingenuous to your story. But I think if you look out in, in, in the world and you see, you know, like we all have a base, we have basic emotions that are at the, at, at, you know, at our, at our base level of all of our like, you know, issues and problems. And if you can make, if you can figure out what about, like, again, I'm just gonna talk about Lara, Lara Parker again very quickly because, you know, uh, chronic illness is something that people are, more, are talking about more, uh, more openly and more readily. People are being heard. Um, uh, you know, Me Too and women and women's movement in general. Like the name of the book is Vagina Problems, and she's specifically talking about sex and and her and her vag and her whole situation. And also, like she's, I think so. So, but this is her life. Like she didn't. Like she doesn't. She's not experiencing this because she wants to be a part of a revolution. She's trying to find a way to, to process whatever has been put on her plate in a way that feels like she's, uh, you know, making a contribution and helping other people feel seen. And she's also expressing herself and it's cathartic for her. And I think that thinking about how your pain could potentially, and it doesn't always have to be pain, but <laughs> I mean, I feel like memoirs are usually a lot of conflict. Write something funny and happy, that's fun, that's fun too. But there's always some kind of pain in there. Um, but, but that's the one thing that I would think, that's what I want. I want someone to come to me and say, you know, this is my specific story and this is how I'm telling it, but also I see longer legs for this because this is how I see it playing out in the world right now and when we can put those things together like that's like that's an argument that i can make for you that's a case that i can make for you with an editor and a publisher awesome thank you jl so lastly i wanted to tell everyone how if you want to get involved we're having a little miniature memoir twitter pitch party for the rest of the day so if you have a memoir that you're interested in putting out there to the world if you go on twitter pitch it in a tweet and use the hashtag pitch or p-i-t gotham p-i-t-g-o-t-h-a-m that way i can sort them and find them all 
we're going to pick some of the better ones, some of our favorite ones, and send them to JL for feedback. So Bring it. that's Bring your right. feeling. <laughs> <laughs> so get on Twitter. Uh, again, the hashtag is P-I-T-G-O-T-H-A-M. If you don't include that hashtag, I won't be able to find it. So make sure you include that hashtag. You don't have to tag us or anything, but just include that hashtag. Pitch us your memoir. And thank you all for being here for the first ever Gotham Writers Inside Writing. We're going to be back in subsequent Wednesdays. So we hope to see you then. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Josh. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>